What's happening, Notorious Family? Welcome to another episode of P2R Films. Forgive the crazy looking hat, y'all know it's a pandemic. My hair chopped. This episode came by when I was in Memphis, Tennessee. Not too long ago, kicking it with some partners. They brought up the Craig Petty's video. Half of them said he was a snitch in a rat. The other half said, man, that's a rumor. Y'all believe that rumor. Well, I said, I researched stuff like that. I didn't see it. But I did find this. And I showed it to them. I never put it out. They was like, man, you need to put that out. That is crazy. It is. This short story is wild. I'm, now, I'm a big conspiracy theorist, I have to admit. I never seen a federal case put out like this. Now this is written by a reporter, I'm guessing, and most other articles and stuff. But the way this person put it out there, I never seen a federal case put out there like that. So it made me think, what is, it, what is going on? Is it really what it seemed to be? You know, it's crazy. Those who know these people, they know. But right now it seemed kind of a conspiracy or maybe not. Welcome to Southside Notorious. This episode we're giving you Mississippi Dave. Meet Craig Pettis. One. June 2004. A three-year state and federal investigation into the sale of cocaine in Jefferson Davis County had came to an end. Four people were arrested and more arrest was expected. The suspects were taken into custody in Basefield, Mississippi, which U.S. Attorney Dunn Lampton said had became a source of cocaine from Mobile, Memphis, Jackson, and Hattiesburg. Federal, state, and local drug agents filled Lucas Road in a Tuesday morning just west of Prentice in front of the sprawling estate of David Warren, a person of interest in a three-year federal investigation. Warner wasn't home when agents arrived, but earlier in the day, Baysville agents were able to arrest Applewhite, Hot Saw, C-Boot, and B-Boot as part of their operation. Warner was on the run since officer raided his sprawling 5,100 square feet home in rural Jefferson Davis County. 5,100 square feet. That's big boy right there. That's big boy talk. That's not small time right there. That's big boy. Authorities say that's where the 31 year old based his multi million dollar drug ring. 14 of Dave's lieutenants have been prosecuted for their roles in a drug ring that distributed more than 8,000 pounds of marijuana and more than 500 kilos of cocaine in Mobile, Alabama, Memphis, Tennessee, Jackson, and Hattiesburg, Mississippi. When Warner learned police and federal agents were searching his house in Mississippi in 2004, he ran. And while he was on the run, he got a phone call from Memphis drug kingpin, Craig Pettis, who said Dave could come live in Mexico, where Pettis had fled two years earlier. Warner and Pettis were two Americans on the run in a small community of 16 to 20 people living in exile, and they worked directly with the Mexican drug cocktail leader known as La Barbie. Petty's has changed from drug kingpin Warner got to know in the late 1990s in Memphis through Antonio Allen, a member of Petty's drug organization. Warner had been a drug dealer in the southern part of Mississippi who came to Memphis for drag races, and through Allen, he met Petty's and became part of the group as they parted at Memphis night spots and eventually became working with each other in the drug trade. We all knew we had basically similar occupations, Werner said. 
Warner sold cocaine to Petty's two or three times and later Petty's began supplying Warner who grew his operations in Mississippi centered in a small town of Prentice where Warner had lived his whole life until he fled to Mexico in 2004. Warner testified that he was ready to get out of the business twice, at least temporarily because it was attracting too much attention that I was on the radar. Petty's knew many of the people Warner worked with and Petty's began working with them, but still urging Warner to do one or more package, one or more package, one or more package. Warner describes his growing role in the drug trade as becoming a dominant factor in Mississippi. And he was on a radar of authorities. Warner was tipped that his house has been raided and there was a warrant for his arrest. He fled to Dallas at first, asked by defense attorneys who told him. Warner said he didn't remember their names. With instructions from Petty's, Warner walked across the U.S.-Mexico border from Laredo, Texas into Nouveau Laredo and flew from there to Acapulco where Petty's was living. Petty's had already rented Warner a home there. We were a community of individuals on the run, Warner said, of the Americans he got to know there. He and Petty still stood out. We were probably the only black guys in the whole city on a regular basis. He also noticed a change in Petty's, who were staying up to date on a series of drug busts and arrests in Memphis that were unraveling the organization even as it was selling millions of dollars worth of cocaine. His whole demeanor had changed, Warner recalled. He wanted to be like the cartels. The scary part was we had never talked about having anybody done to anybody. The first conversation about violence was when Prentiss found out some suspects cooperated in the federal investigation of Warner in Mississippi were out on bond. He asked if I wanted to have something done to them. Warner testified and said, he told Petty's, what are you talking about? What about the guys still in prison? That's the difference between me and you. At first, Warner thought Petty's was talking above his head. If anybody ticked him off, he got to the point where they got to go. Warner said, meanwhile, Warner was learning of the violent deaths of several members of the organizations back in Memphis. A later conversation with Petty's, Warner recalled as shocking and the saddest day of his exile in Mexico aside from his capture there. Petty's admitted that he had a close friend killed. That was my partner, Warner said. He challenged Petty's on how Petty's knew his friend had cooperated. He had connections with the city, Warner said of Petty's. He spoke on that extensively. He said he definitely knew. Allegations of connections to law enforcement who told Petty's and others in the organization who was cooperating has been an undercurrent in the testimony of several witnesses in the trial. That includes people who were at meetings in Memphis with Petty's where plans to kill his close friend and others were discussed. Orlando Pride testified that Geraldine Galloway, the president of a bail bond company, told Petty's of those cooperating and that Petty's claimed in Memphis that he knew he had the information in black and white. The close friend was cooperating and had worn a wire in federal investigations of Petty's. In Acapulco, Warner met the Mexican drug kingpin known as La Barbie, Edgar Valdez Valreal. Valdez was second in command to Arturo Beltran Leva, 
the head of a faction of the splinter Sinaloa drug cartel. Warner quoted Valdez as telling him, you are at home now. This city's ours. You don't have to worry about police here. We carry guns, Warner said. We drove all stolen vehicles. Warner recalled getting pulled over by the police in Acapulco and putting an associate of Valdez on his next telephone to talk to the officer. The officer then apologized for pulling Warner over. It was a dramatic transition for Warner. I was totally ignorant of the facts of the cartels, he said. Tuesday, I've got 200 agents in my home trying to get me. Thursday, I'm in another country. But there were challenges to the new way of life. Warner was captured July 8, 2005 by Mexican authorities. He said they had tracked his location to Toluca, Mexico, about 20 miles outside Mexico City from his Nextel phone. They set up surveillance in a lot across the street from his house in a lot where a house was being built. One day, two workers asked for a drink of water as Warner bent over to pick up a garden hose. The two officers posing as the workers grabbed him and put him under arrest. Pettis was captured in Mexico in January 2008. Warner is one of several witnesses who have testified or expected to testify at the trial who are being held at the federal prison in Mason, Tennessee. Every night, everybody is talking about the case. He said of other prisoners, there when asked about it by defense attorney Marty McAfee, who asked him to name the others and what they talking about. You want me to name all 200 people at Mason? It's nothing to brag on what I'm doing. Let's break it down that way, he said. The trial resumes Tuesday, February 21st, after Monday's federal holiday. Warner pled guilty to conspiracy to possess 150 kilos of cocaine with intent to distribute. He agreed to forfeit more than $62,000 and a sprawling Jefferson Davis country home. Warner could get life in prison and a $4 million fine when he is sentenced June 8 by federal judge Keith Starrett. Federal prosecutor John Mayende said Warner was probably the biggest drug dealer that we have dealt with in Mississippi in the past five or six years, trafficking millions of dollars worth of cocaine. Warner decided on his own to plead guilty, said his attorney, John Collette. Posted on September 12, 2007, David Warner, a man labeled by federal authorities as a major drug supplier was sentenced Wednesday to 22 and a half years in prison by a federal judge. U.S. District Judge Keith Starrett also placed Warner on a five-year supervised parole once he is released from prison. Warner pleaded guilty to possession of distribution of 330 pounds of cocaine in March 2006. Warner was on the U.S. Marshal Service 15 most wanted fugitives listed when he was captured in Mexico in July 2005. Mexican authorities said Warner had been living in a gated community about 35 miles from Mexico City. How they say? Sheesh. Some big boy talk right there. Big boy stuff. It's not such and such out the block that had a few things. No, this is some serious talk to the point to when you skip and the plug, the plug plug, 
say you home now. But, like I say, out of all the witnesses they said they had, they put this business out there. Now, I'm not here to judge and say what's going on, what's not. Because it's not actual court paperwork, but it's out there, it's documented, it's out there. But I never seen anything out there like that. Not like that. That's what got me. Until the next episode, one love.